I'm Steve Brule with Studio Brule, and I'm here with Paul Elam, uh, formerly or still with a, <laughs> a voice for men and an ear. Formerly? <laughs> have I been fired? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're concentrating on an ear for men now, right? Yes, I am. Okay, so that's where I was going with that. And um, we're here today talking about health and health uh, issues relating to men in particular, obviously. And Paul, you started out, I remember that you put a video out and talked a bit about your experience uh, using diet to control your diabetes, which you had a lot of success with not only the control of diabetes, but um, losing weight at the same time. Yeah, uh, knock on wood, it's been successful. I came upon the issue, uh, quite honestly, like most men do, by becoming diabetic instead of <laughs> eating healthy in my youth and uh, taking care of myself. Uh, I ended up in the emergency room one day with an ar arrhythmia with, um, um, it, oh gosh, it's been a while since I've dealt with it, so I forgot what they've even called it, uh, but AFib, uh, afibrillation. And while I was in the emergency room with my heart doing the mamba in my chest, they tested me and my glucose was 575. Uh, which is like uh, I was a walking, talking Tootsie Pop. Um, wow. What is the normal upper limit? For uh, You're looking, you know, uh, if for somebody that's eating uh, 100 to 110, you know, uh, fasting, it, it should be a little lower than that. But uh, it was nearly five or six times higher wow. than it should have been. It was dangerously high, uh, in other words. Um, and that was the first indication. No, I take that back. That was not the first indication that I had diabetes. I'd been told years before that, that I was headed for diabetes, that I had what's called metabolic syndrome, which was basically eating too much, uh, and especially eating the wrong foods and developing insulin resistance, which is what happens. You uh, eat a lot of sugars, carbohydrates, things like that. It causes insulin spikes in your system. Eventually, uh, you become uh, insulin resistant. And then the next step, of course, of that is diabetes, um, which carries with it all kinds of nasty consequences, increased risk of stroke, heart attack, uh, all kinds of uh, wonderful things, blindness, uh, cutting off toes and feet and things like that if you don't manage it. Uh, luckily, it is a very manageable disease if you wise up and take it seriously. And you can do that through diet. And uh, so far, what I've been able to do uh, is get off of, I've returned my A1C to a completely normal range. Uh, for over a year now, I have been off of all medications for diabetes simply by managing my diet. And that's a big success story. And you lost a lot of weight in the process as well, right? Well, I fluctuated. I lost 70 pounds. I mean, I, uh, certainly after the incidents of going to the hospital and all that, uh, I became very serious for a very long time about not going back to the hospital. I lost yeah. 70 pounds. Uh, then this last holiday season, I have uh, put about 20 of it back on. Um, and But I've gone back and now I'm losing it again. And losing it is quite easy. It's just a matter of eating the right foods and more importantly staying away from the wrong foods the wrong foods being carbohydrates in general right carbohydrates sure well sugar is carbohydrate right. but yes uh, staying right. away uh, from simple carbohydrates uh, which are the ones that metabolize very quickly and cause insulin spikes you stay away from those if you're going to eat carbs eat what's called slow carbs the complex carbohydrates um, like in whole are, grains and whatnot? Yeah, but it's also important to note too, and uh, you know, the more research they're doing, is they're saying, you know, don't think you can go wild on whole grains and, and have that be healthy for you, especially once you have diabetes. It, it may help you in the long run pre prevent it from happening, but uh, it is not... Um, a great answer. You could, if you eat a bunch of whole wheat bread and a bunch of whole wheat pastas all the time, you can end up in trouble. That the way. same kind of trouble with a, an overload, glucose overload, right? You could still develop insulin to, uh, uh, tolerance uh, and end up diabetic that way. 
the best course of action uh, in general that I found, and again, I encourage people to do their own, their own research because there is a ton of bullshit about diet in the world out there. You really have to dig. But generally what I'm finding has worked for me is to keep my carbohydrates complex and keep them under 70 a day, under 70 carbs. Yeah. A day. And that actually affords you a fair amount of flexibility in your diet. But mainly what we're talking about is high protein, high fat. Um, that's a, a funny thing about this is, is that we finally figured out they've had the food pyramid that they developed in the 50s. They're just starting to figure out that it's wrong. And they put wheats and grains at the top of the, the pyramid. They, think, they thought that was the healthy way to eat, uh, totally ignoring the fact that if, when you want to fatten up cattle, you feed them corn, carbohydrates in, right. in, in high That's doses. A good point. That's a good observation there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They've sort of ignored reality. And of course, then the food industry has invested a huge amount in high carbohydrate foods, stuff in the center aisles of, of supermarkets, infusing sugar into foods that don't need it to make them addictive. I mean, you're really up against, you know, in our sort of red pill existence, we learn to unlearn a lot of things about life. In, in our case, in, in the men's movement, we unlearn a lot of stuff we've learned about women and about relationships and about sexual politics. This is one of those areas too, where you really have to go back and undo all the damage that's done from the bullshit information that's being sold to you by the government and by the food industry. Um, there's a lot of money in treating these diseases that are caused by overeating. And of course we got people out there uh, with particularly feminists, which, you know, I may curse myself later for trying to, you know, appeal to them for some common sense, but we have a fat acceptance movement. And what that is, is a diabetes acceptance. Movement. Mm. It's a heart disease acceptance movement. It's a cancer acceptance movement. Obesity kills. It absolutely does. And it diminishes quality of life and it causes those three big diseases, the diabetes, uh, heart disease, and cancer. And uh, obesity is on the rise for quite a long time now. Uh, it's in staggering proportions now. Uh, we have been infusing foods with sugar now for so long. I think uh, I'll probably get nailed for getting these numbers not exactly right, but I know that Somewhere in the neighborhood of, of around 1930, the average American consumed something like four pounds of sugar a year. And now it's over 100 pounds. And of course, sugar is completely unnecessary in your diet. You can cut it down to zero and be healthy, right? And, and you will be a lot healthier. A lot now. healthier, yeah. Yeah, and that, that's one Utterly thing you unnecessary. to avoid. The, there's no RDA for sugar. And there's, as a matter of fact, there's no RDA or recommended daily allowance for carbohydrates. There, there is none. You can live without carbohydrates. It's not ideal, uh, but you can make it on protein and, and fats. And fats alone, yeah. And, and that's, there's a diet exactly around that, right? That's just uh, protein and fat, like zero carb diet. Uh, I forget the name of it. I, somebody a ketogenic. Okay, okay, there you go. Yeah, yeah. And there, I've never tried that. I mean, I've, I've never been particularly interested in going, you know, zero carbs. Um, I don't think I would like it very much. There, yeah. Uh, and another thing that you run into that is an issue, I mean, we got to be frank about this stuff, is that people have a general cutoff, a tendency uh, to cut off at a certain level of fats. There's only so much we can tolerate. That's why you don't see people eating like a stick of butter. Uh, yeah, because it feels bad just to hear even the it. thought of that. <laughs> yes, uh, because your body, you're going to have a natural cutoff on how much fat you can tolerate, and and your body will shut you down from doing that. Just like trying to eat a stick of butter, no matter how much you like butter, you're not going to have much luck with that. No. Uh, but carbohydrates, what happens with them is they bring you a lot of empty calorie, calories, it metabolizes very quickly, 
and leaves you hungry. It causes a spike in your insulin and that plummets and you followed by hunger. And you become literally addicted to it. This is, you know. Self-perpetuating and yeah. When, when you pick up a <clears throat> loaf of bread, which has no reason whatsoever to have sugar in it, and you see that sugar is one of the ingredients in a, in a plain loaf of bread, what you know is, is that they put that in there to addict you. Sugar is an addictive substance. And, and it's dirt cheap, too, for them we, to buy and add to things. Yep. And that's a, this is an experience with me on peanut butter is the same thing is that I can't stomach the craft, the Skippy, those kind of peanut butters that are loaded up with sugar now because I buy peanut butter that is just literally, it's just ground peanuts. And when you get it, it's oil on the top. So you have to stir it up quite a bit. Yep. But once, and this is just a little tip, if you put it in the fridge after you stir it up, it doesn't separate out again. Uh, at least not for a very, very long time. So it works quite well. But now that I've gotten used to that kind of peanut butter, I can't stomach the sweetened peanut butter. And that's what will happen, is that if you start eating healthy, you end up detoxing from all the crap foods that you've been sold, all the carbohydrates, all the sugars that's been uh, slid sort of uh, underneath the table to you in a lot of food sources, and you start losing your taste for it. Uh, and, and it only takes three or four days. Uh, most people give up before them because carbohydrates are so addictive. Uh, and a lot of people, I know, for instance, myself, I went through one phase years ago, back in the, uh, in the, uh, the same time we did the conference in Detroit, and I was eating vegetarian. Oh, and really? I, and I did not, yeah, and I ate vegetarian for two years, and I didn't understand why I wasn't losing weight. Hmm. I would think, okay, it's not meat, it's not animal fat, and, and uh, oh, and I, I can promise you somebody will show up in the comments to this discussion um, talking about being <clears throat> and, and recommending movies like um, not our Forks Over Knives and things like that. Uh, been there, done that. Um, but you were still eating a lot of carbs then with that vegetarian diet. I was eating a, a ton of carbs. With it. As a matter of fact, I was probably eating more because I licensed myself uh, to eat more uh -huh. of other foods because I wasn't eating animal protein. Huh. Um, but the fact of the matter is, animal protein is good. My opinion, from the research I've done, from the things that I've read, from the, the dietary sources I trust, um, I'm fine with animal protein. I'm, fi I'm fine with meat. So the big three really is fish, uh, beef, and chicken, basically, right, in terms of... I eat protein. a lot less beef. Uh, I think red meat does have, if you overdo it, probably some not-so-positive effects. I eat a lot of chicken, a lot of fish, and I do get organic uh, on the poultry uh, because... Yeah, it's some pretty nasty stuff. <laughs> if you they, don't, it's... the poultry industry is a bit uh, is a bit um, suspicious as well. They use a lot of drugs and stuff. I think in that. Um, the reason, one of the reasons I wanted to get uh, kind of kickstart this discussion with you, Paul, is that recently uh, there was two guys who are Facebook friends and uh, and one a fellow who's who's a friend in general um, that uh, I hope one day will come on and talk to us about their experiences in losing quite a lot of weight by this. Um, by a couple of different methods. A lot, a lot of them are doing a high, uh, several, a couple of them are doing um, carbohydrate restriction, basically, uh, very strong carbohydrate restriction, uh, and have had rapid weight loss. And in one case, the one fellow reported 50 pounds in, I think, around two months or something like this, a very large amount of weight loss. Now, he had, he had a lot to go, so he some of that probably water and whatnot. But I, I also been looking into this a bit myself as over the years, I, I, I guess over the 10 or 15 years of work stress <laughs> until recently, I put on about 50 pounds myself. And uh, when I was approaching 200, I started to exercise quite a lot, try thinking if I exercise, I'd be losing weight. And I was up to doing something like um, uh, 40 kilometers on the bike and uh, three to five kilometers in the pool in the same day. And I still didn't lose weight. Wow. I didn't know what was going on there. So anyways, I got, I got prayed kind of, and I was getting hip pains and uh, still having hip pains at that time and 
neck pains all the time and all this stuff. And I, I saw a video on a guy who was talking about some met metabolic stuff. And I'm trying to go to, I'm going to find those links that we can put them into the descriptions. And he was talking about um, your body's need to fast for some period of time on a regular basis. And he had a uh, um, proposition that 16 hours a day you shouldn't eat. So basically if you stop eating at 6 PM, then you don't start again until 10 AM the next day. And apparently that allow, first eight hours, your body processes all the stuff in your blood that you've eaten from your last time, but it takes about eight hours roughly or so to do this stage of processing. After which your body has to use resources from within. And you want it, the diet part of it was you want to try and kick those use of those resources over to the use of fats, not proteins. And one of the one of the ways to do that is to eat lots of protein um, to kind of kick down the body using protein as fuel. And when it does, it use it actually uses your muscles, muscle tissue as and, and converts that into energy, which is not what you want. And um, so that uh, the adding the protein prevents that from going. And then by not having a lot of carbs or reducing your carbs, you're kind of pushing your metabolism to using fats as an energy source, which is ironically, the weird thing is the fats are the hardest thing for your body to use up as energy. I always thought it's it was. Your, no, it's because your body will select the carbohydrates to metabolize. Carbohydrates first. And the weird thing is, Paul, it will sec, it'll select protein, muscle protein before fat even. Yep. This, is, this was a, like a news to me. I had I always presumed it would be for carbs, then fat, then muscle. But it, on a when you when a, when somebody uh, like goes on a fast after a period of a couple of days, I think it is two three days, your body actually starts to dig into muscle tissue for energy. Yep. So one of the things this fellow was was pointing out is that you need to have the protein present in your blood uh, to prevent that from happening. And, and another thing was that I've tried is. Um, getting in the gym because building muscle consumes protein that you eat and converts into muscle and more muscle burns energy even while you're sitting around yes so, it boosts your metabolism uh, every time your metabolism? You, every time you exercise and there's hours uh, it's one of the reasons they recommend uh, exercising in the morning instead of at night because exercise has a, a tendency to to raise your metabolism and keep you up. But there's another advantage to this is the, the pro the extra muscle mass, that muscle, even when you're just sitting there is like a, it's like an idling V8 engine, right? That idling V8 engine uses more gas than an idling four cylinder engine. And with a car, it's, it's even more than that because with a car you drive it, you don't idle that much, you turn it off, but with a body, it never turns off. Right, so you're idling your body probably twenty hours a day. <laughs> you know, your body sits on idle twenty hours a day, roughly speaking. Yep. If, that, if those are big muscles, they're going to be using up more energy than small muscles. So I thought I'd throw that out there. Do you, now to get down to some specifics, Paul. Like in terms of. If you if someone is has a bad diet and they're, they're they're they want to change switch this kind of health thing around, what kind of specific patterns or or what have you tried in terms of like when in the day do you eat? Do you eat in the morning mostly, or the midday, or do you spread it through the day? Or I'm ridiculously undisciplined about the timing of my food, and I probably could improve that a lot more. But I generally start each day in the morning uh, with a brand called Carb Master yogurt, uh, just a simple yogurt uh, uh, that I have in the morning it has like uh, five grams of carbohydrate per container. Um, and then if I'm still hungry, which I frequently am, I'll make something like eggs and sausage. It's a perfectly uh, great, uh, eggs come down to a little bit less than one carb a piece, so a couple of eggs, and sausage, all meat sausage that has no carbs in it. Um, uh, you can start a day with the yogurt and a big breakfast like that on, you know, um, seven or eight carbs max. Now, do you count your 
carbs, your protein, your fats, and your total calories? Do you kind of keep a running track of all this? Don't I don't care about fat. Don't really care that much about calories. What I care about is calculating my net carbs, and you do net that carbs. by subtracting fiber. Um, whatever, say if you've got something that has ten carbohydrates in a serving and it has three grams of dietary fiber, you subtract that from the total for oh. seven, seven net carbs. So when they rate these things down, the total carbs includes the fiber that you can't digest. Well, right. Well, it'll give you the total carbs on the, on the package, and then it will say whatever you know, amount of dietary fiber there is. So yeah, just to be clear, that total includes the dietary fiber part of it. It no, it, it does you not. You have to. Out. You got to have to. You have to subtract it yourself. Yeah, that's what I meant. Like it's if it says ten and three, it's seven is your diet is your carbs that you actually absorb. Right. Right. Okay. And uh, it is, which makes high fiber food, which are naturally good for you anyway. I mean, uh, stuffs like avocados that have a lot of fat and a lot of fiber, have very much lower net carbs and an abundant amount of fiber, which is really good for your system anyway. I mean, you should be aiming to pick foods like that. Well, one of my own personal experience just last fall is that when I first read this, I saw this one guy's video talking about this stuff, I decided to give it a shot because I really wasn't losing any weight. And um, so I, I tried, tried to stop eating at 8 p.m. and not eat till noon the next day, which I thought it would be hard, but it actually was kind of easy. The one thing that I do have in the morning was green tea with ginger in it, no sugar, no whatnot. So I just sip on green tea with ginger and the ginger really kind of soothes your stomach. So I didn't feel hungry at all. And in fact, by the time it came to noon, oftentimes I didn't even think to eat because the, the green tea with ginger kind of completely wipes out my appetite. And in six weeks, I lost almost 20 pounds between 50 and 20 pounds. I didn't measure myself exactly when I started that. But when I, I got at the end of about six weeks, I noticed, geez, my pants are loose. So I thought, I'll go weigh myself, see what's going on here. And I was down to 175. And Outstanding. That, yeah. I, I was really surprised. So I thought, this guy's on to something. Because between noon and eight, I wasn't really doing anything dieting. I was mostly trying to eat more protein. So fish, chicken, eggs. Uh, milk, milk has a surprising amount of protein in it. I didn't know that before looking into it either. <laughs> but it does. It has actually a really good source of protein. But um, and I tried to keep the carbs down because this is one fellow was saying that carbs really are a bad actor all around. Like there, the, I mean, if you're gonna, if you can pinpoint one thing that is a constant certain about diet, it is that carbs are bad. Carbs are bad. Get, get rid of them. And like you were saying earlier, I didn't aim and I don't aim to get rid of them altogether because I'll still eat some bread or some crackers. And I, I'm not sticking rigidly to anything. There's some days I, I miss that whole time frame thing too, and I'm not beating myself over the head about it. I think over the long run is what really matters, you know, if you miss out on a couple of days here and there. But the one thing I, am, I put right, really strong in my patterns right now is to, is to get to the gym. Uh, and I think that's done that in combination with this diet is as I feel a lot better all around. I don't have hip pains. I don't have neck pains uh, anymore. So it's, it's as a whole range of benefits that have come about as a result of that. And yeah, you know, I didn't even mention that. I, I tend to focus my attention in terms of things like my A1C and, you know, where my glucose is and whether or not I'm on medication, but the, dietary change also brought with it a very big increase in energy and oh. sense of sense of well-being that I had not had for years. Uh, even before I was diabetic, I felt lousy because I was eating lousy food all the time. And of course, I either, you know, just failed to make the connection or didn't want to make the connection uh, between that massive bowl of pasta and feeling like crap all afternoon. I thought, God, could there be a connection here? No, there can't possibly be because I love pasta. I remember when you were eating that pasta stuff because uh, you, we had talked and you had just been come back from Italy and you were talking about the great pasta you had everywhere. 
everywhere. I, I did, and I ate it. I mean, yeah, how can you be in Italy and not have pasta? Not have, it's pretty hard to avoid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I think I could do it now w without a problem. I just don't eat the stuff. Um, and a lot of this process for me, it's one of the reasons I, I really... Uh, not just glad about this stuff for the health benefit of the information, but this is to me more red pilling. You know, we literally have been lied to about food our whole lives. We're getting lied to every day. You can go in a grocery store right now and find all kinds of labels, uh, heart healthy and stuff like that on foods that are crap for you. That's terrible. Yeah. You know, brands like snack wells, that are just pure carbohydrate pure and, carbs, and, and they're marketed sugar. as a health food. Um, I've got an example of that too, because uh, being into the trying to do my gym thing now and build a little bit of muscle, I carry around the protein bars just in case I'm hungry and I don't want to have to go into some fast food thing to, to get the little hunger off, right? So I carry a little protein bar around with me in case that comes up and I eat that. But I looked at some of these protein bars, some of the ones that I was eating is really not very much protein and a whole pile of sugar in them. Yes. And then they'll advertise it as a protein bar and you read it and there's this like what five grams of protein and then all these sugars and carbs. And thought, yeah. Oh. And you know, if you're a 24 year old athlete, there was three and a half percent body fat and you just rode 18 miles uh, uphill on a bicycle. Yeah. It's okay to eat one of those. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but it, they're not health foods and most of them are not good as health foods all the time and they are literally killing people with food that's being labeled as heart healthy and diet you know uh sensible diet food um and that makes it sort of a another one of those things in life i mean i think people that gravitate toward men's issues uh, a lot of ways and toward the red pill like to to myth bust yeah, to, to to cut through bullshit in the world. And another benefit that I really believe that it gave me uh, was uh, I had smoked until seven years ago. And I finally quit smoking and managed to get myself addicted to nicotine lozenges, which is a hell of a lot better choice than smoking cigarettes. But after I got the weight off and got feeling better, I was able finally to get off of the nicotine lozenges. Hmm. And so now I'm not a slave to that either. And to me, this is literally about slavery. Hmm. They're addicting us to garbage foods to make a profit. And then what gives us diseases and they make a profit off of that. Um, off there is yeah. a, totally unholy alliance between the pharmaceutical medical industry and the food industry. Um, mm. When you start digging into that, you find stuff that makes your skin crawl. Mm. Didn't doctors at one point promote smoking as a health benefit, a kind of a perk you up? Oh, yeah. And of course, the cigarette industry really fought back hard against the uh, cancer research Yes. Oh, they fought back again and, and, and uh, had something like 11 tobacco company executives sit before Congress and swear that nicotine was or cigarettes were not addictive. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wish somebody would have passed me that note. <laughs> you remember that? Did you ever see that movie? Thank you for smoking. Yes. <laughs> that was good. eh? Yes, it was uh, about the uh, tobacco. For comedy, really? Obvious. Yeah, it was a yeah. it was a very dark comedy. Dark comedy, yeah. yeah. Um, but they that, got their points across. And that is the sort of thing we're dealing with with food. Uh, just people just don't realize it that yeah. you know they're every fast food joint in the country is selling you poison. So, what do you think about the fa the fasting aspect of diet? Well, it's a little different for me as a diabetic. One of the things that I know is that if I go too long without eating, I start feeling bad. Okay. And, and I'm, not, I'm not sure that going 16 hours a day would be an optimum thing for me to do. If you're um, a diabetic kind of person, that'd be a problem for sure. It could be. I mean, yeah. certainly, especially as a diabetic, I wouldn't do it unless I had some sound medical you know, support and advice about what I was doing. But so you want to pay attention to how you're feeling when you try new things like that. 
And that's one thing, you know, young men won't notice. When, when I was in my 20s, I could eat like an absolute pig and I go play softball and would feel great, no problem. But when you start getting older, you feel what you eat. A great yeah. deal. Yeah, yeah. And, exactly. and that's one thing you can absolutely trust. And I had that issue for years. I would eat high carbohydrate meals, feel like crap, and refuse to make a connection hmm. between the two because I wanted to eat the high carbohydrate foods. Yeah, yeah. I've been there. I've been I've eaten an awful lot of Doritos and regretted it. Yeah. <laughs> More than more times than I care to remember. There was I, one... I, 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 I do hope that, you know, whoever it was in your audience that was talking about losing weight and do, I hope some of the guys contact you and maybe come on uh, a discussion and, and talk about this because this is some really great information uh, that benefits men. And it's one of the things that we uh, don't do very well as men. We don't take care of ourselves. And well, I hope just that the audience pays attention to that and do, if you have success stories or if you have struggles, uh, one of the things we're, we're hoping to do, and I was hoping with, with you in this, uh, Paul, is that we can kind of um, get other people's ideas, uh, what worked for them, what doesn't work for them. And maybe people can get some guys can get some encouragement out of uh, and reaching those kind of goals. They, they want, they want to. I just want to throw this one. There's one fellow that was saying that he fasts every second day. Now I haven't tried that because a, a whole 24 hours day uh, for me, I thought it sounds hard and I'll try it sometime, but he was doing every second day and uh, he lost a ton of weight. That was a fellow who said he lost uh, about 50 pounds in a short order. And yeah, he, I talked to him too. And he, he has done very well. Great. Great. And he says he doesn't have a problem. Like, he he just he drinks coffee in the day that he doesn't that he fasts and then i think he just the only thing he pays attention to on the eating day is not having too much carbs as far as my memory was uh, what he said did he talk about that with you paul yeah that was pretty much the plan just avoided a lot of the simple carbs didn't go overboard even even on complex carbs and fasted every other day um yeah. And I'm sure for him, uh, I mean, he's dropped a lot of weight and very quickly. Uh, right. And uh, not that I'm recommending fasting. I, like I said, I, can't, I won't recommend anything that I haven't done myself. But the portion of it, of getting away from the carbs, it's the simplest thing in the world. All you got to do is detox, go through a little bit of withdrawal. And there is a withdrawal from eating the so-called normal, you know, North American diet. To Not to mention stuff. just the habit changing, you know, it, it takes a long time just to actually change a habit, even if it's not addictive or you're not addicted to this thing, just a pure habit change is, is can take a couple of months even, and for, depending who you are, I suppose. Yeah, it, it can. Um, but the good news is with eating this way, you will see results very quickly. Yeah. Uh, if, if you cut carbs down to way low, then don't eat sugar and stick with high protein and high fat stuff, you will lose weight. And just to tie off the fasting aspect of it, uh, and if somebody's out there who's familiar with the bio, the medical, the bio processes related to this, my understanding from what I said, and I could have this wrong, so do correct me in the comments, uh, is that by doing some period of fasting, at least more than eight hours after you last eat, it forces your body into a mode of keeping those, those uh, metabolic processes open that will burn, help you burn fat. So long as you don't go into protein deficiency, you want to avoid protein deficiency so that you don't start digging into your muscles, which you want because they, they not, not only help you uh, feel better and stronger, but they also burn energy for you while you're sleeping <laughs> take that vegans yes. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> and they will be in your comments <laughs> raising a stink they certainly came into mind i did a video uh, about uh, one way of avoiding carbs is to generally avoid food that's white right potatoes avoid sugar avoid bread I mean, you start looking, there's, there's a couple of exceptions. Cauliflower is really good for you. All the cruciferous vegetables are good for you. But for the most part, if you avoid white foods, 
you'll be avoiding a ton of carbs. I'm and, guessing that it's possible um, for vegans to have a high protein, low carb diet, but I, I don't know anything about it. Maybe uh, someone who has been able to do that can enlighten us on it. I just think it's a lot easier if you're eating fish, chicken, and meat or, or some combination of it because the proteins are so easy to get. You know, if, if, if you look, and, and this, is, this is pure human physiology, if you watch any of the survival shows where people have to scrounge in the wilderness for food, their number one objective is protein. Right. Because that's, humans are omnivores, but we need protein. And, that's and right. we and, didn't get to mix rice and beans 6,000 years ago. Uh, we had to take what was out there and what was out there was animals. Animals. Just to, the other part of the whole if fasting thing, and this is interesting to me too, which I was surprised at when I, I looked into it a little bit, is that if you have a long-term fast uh, for starving to death, let's say, your body will actually even start to use your heart muscle. I don't know why that evolutionarily happens, um, but it will like you would have I would I wish, before I would have thought that your evolution would have required us to preserve your muscles because you're going to need those to survive. Right. But uh, evidently, no muscle tissue actually is used up for energy pretty early on in the um, in the starvation process. And I don't remember the exact time, but it's it's less than a two or three days. I, I think if you fast one day, I think you're probably OK. You're not really digging into to muscle tissue too much but i think if you're three days or more your body actually is getting rid of tissue that you don't want to get rid of including heart muscles so something to be aware of the importance and that all drives back to the importance of proteins as being protein being your most important macronutrient i think fats are up there too well you've just convinced me not to fast <laughs> <laughs> But I do have something else that is working, and and I'm sure that the fasting is. I know again the gentleman we discussed a little bit uh, on his case. He's fasting for every other day, and it's working like gangbusters for him. Yeah, and I think that's that's one of the keys. Like people are different in their in what they like, how they respond to different things, both mentally and physically. So try things that different strategies until you find something that's working for you. But do keep an eye out for the healthy aspect of it. You don't want to like go on some, try on some diet and then end up in the hospital for some un, unforeseen reason, you know. And again, be careful where you get your information. Uh, one of the things that I was handed when I was, when I was diagnosed with diabetes was the American Diabetes Association recommended diet, which is fucking garbage. It is a diet that will literally give you diabetes. So where did you find the diet you ended up following? Where did you, what information, where did you get your information? The, I've done a lot of research and I found one website and there's, there's several really very decent websites on keto lifestyle, on um, um, paleo diet, and low, low carb diets. But I refer to one regularly called dietdoctor.com. I don't have any, you know, I'm not plugging them for money or anything like that. But the information there is very solid, very good, highly recommended to, to anybody. If they want to educate themselves about how to eat in a healthy way, um, especially if they're interested in getting rid of these garbage carbohydrates uh, out of their diet, that's a really good place to go. Now, we've, we've stressed here in the whole conversation that carbohydrates are like uh, the devil, but uh, there's also a danger of zero carbohydrates, and that has its own, its own problems, right? I, if you're going towards to extreme zero carbohydrates, you might want to research that very well and um, uh, see that you don't get into some kind of serious trouble doing that. And personally, I, do, I, I don't think that is wise, and it's, and it's not necessary. Um, you can have a good, healthy diet without totally eliminating carbohydrates. I mean, I, I really, I guess I get why people, some people want to do that. Um, but I can tell you, I know for a fact, it's not necessary to lose weight. And it's not necessary, you can just with the, 
uh, a reasonable cutting away of carbs in your diet, you can do something like it took me six months. In six months, I had my A1C in normal range. And remind me what's A1C again? That's your, it's a, a glucose test. Um, it, it's the sort of the gold standard for diabetics. And you're heading to 100 is what you want on that or well, something. No, no, that is, that is blood glucose, uh, which is a different reading. A1C, you get, you're diabetic when you're in a like 7.0 range, 6.8, stuff like that. Um, I had mine when I, the first time I tested it after I had a glucose of 575, the first A1C I got, I had 7.2. Uh, I took it a couple more times, but six months after that, I was down to 5.3 where, where it's been pretty much ever since, which is dead in the middle of normal. Normal is five. 5.3 is where, I, where I've been and it's in normal range. I don't recall exactly what the ranges are. Uh, okay. Easy to Google and find out though. But round seven is where diabetic starts. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think really you get any higher than 6.4, 6.5, you're starting to get in to that range. And how, how long did you say you're under control now with that? Over a year. No drugs, no pills, no nothing? Nothing. Did I was on metformin for several months and lost the weight, got the uh, A1C uh, back to normal and quit taking uh, the metformin, got the doctor to okay it. And then it's been, uh, been quite a while since that process. And I probably had a couple of times because, you know, one of the things, this is an addiction. And like I said, at one point, I put another 20, 25 pounds back on uh, eating crappy food during the holidays. Um, Paul, let me ask you this. Is there a, a stressor that triggers this for you? A stressor in your life or is, or is it stress related that makes you go back for the, that comfort food, if you will? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think it is. I think most eating is emotional on some level. I mean, you, you think about it. How many times are you really hungry? Um, now, when I was, again, in my 20s and uh, working out regularly and, and very robust lifestyle, I would get hungry fairly often. But after I got into my 30s, you know, most of the time I ate. I wasn't really, I didn't feel hunger going on. Uh, eating out of habit, uh, eating out of boredom, eat, um, eating out of uh, maybe stress, uh, uh, it, eating because something is on TV and I want to do something with yeah. my hand and mouth while I'm watching TV. I mean, it's a lot of this is just we eat a lot more than we ever need to. And I think a lot of it is emotional. A lot of it is stress related. And of course, that's one of the evil things about eating to cope with stress is that you get diseases and which gives you a lot more stress <laughs> than you had beforehand. But yeah, I think that's a lot of it. I, I think if we ask, if people ask themselves every time they, they were going to eat, do I really want this? Am I really hungry? Did they ask themselves like, what am I stressed about? Or for me, a lot of it, sometimes when I was eating a lot of chips and Doritos and whatnot, it was partly it was because I want to avoid having to deal with some stressful thing <laughs> and that take my mind off it. I could sit there, watch TV and munch down these things. And I, you know, I've got some stressful thing to do. I don't really freaking want to do it, but you know, so the eating is kind of an avoidance behavior there in a sense. Well, and, and you can trade it out though. There are certainly healthier snack foods than, uh, Doritos, yeah, uh, and those are, you know, Doritos, Cheetos, that's kind of part of what my thing was too, entire bags of them, gone, uh -huh. in, uh -huh. in, been there, in, in, in 30 minutes, um, but there is a lot of stuff you can eat, and uh, what I have found for myself, I don't know what would be, what it would be like for anybody else, is that when I have to make a decision, okay, what healthy snack am I going to have? What am I going to invest in now in order to have a healthy snack? A lot of times I'll just skip the snack because if, if, if I have to actually do something for it, if I can't just go grab a bag and open it and start eating, 
That's got, one of the dangers right there, the accessibility, right? Absolutely. So fast. Instant satisfaction. But if I got to go prepare something, put it on a plate and eat it, then that takes more energy and it takes more thought. So I'm less likely to even go for the healthy snack. You know, this reminds me, I, I shared an apartment, or I had an apartment above a uh, house where this guy I lived with owned the house. I had a little apartment above and he had his two daughters below him. We shared the kitchen. And he used to prepare up chopped like vegetables, like uh, celery sticks, carrots, uh, um, broccoli, whatnot, and put them on the table as quick snacks when his daughters were there. Just for that very reason, because they come in and it, whatever is really accessible is going to be and easiest to do is going to be what you probably eat. Yep. Uh, if they're not there, they're going to go in and get cookies, crackers, chips, you know, because they're right there in a box ready to pop them in and your And of mouth. course, another way to deal with that that's really effective is not to have that shit in your home to begin with. <laughs> yeah. uh, anybody that's serious about, you know, approaching their health differently and eating differently one of the things you really want to do is go through your house with a big plastic trash bag and go into the pantry and go into the fridge and pull all the poison out of your kitchen and throw it away. Right. And then, of course, the, the, the junk food junkie in me wants to say, but I paid for that. It's wasteful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, well, it's wasteful. yeah. Yeah. Diabetes it belongs right. down here, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. I have this coming to me, but it's really a good idea. Throw yeah, the garbage away and you don't buy and, it in the first place, right? And don't be brainwashed by food companies into buying garbage because they, they don't care if you get sick or not. No, they don't. And you know, just touching back on when you were saying about like when you're reaching for a snack, if you have to prepare it, for me, what I've noticed a lot of times since I'm trying to kind of get my habits better. A lot of times I go down to the kitchen, I'm looking for something to eat, and I ask myself, I'm not even hungry. Why am I in the kitchen? I have to go through this mental process. Of, why am I down here in the kitchen looking for something to eat and not even the slightest bit hungry? You know, and usually there's something that's bothering me that caused me that I want to get away from something that's bothering me here. And the kitchen is like a comfort place, right? You got all this, you got food down there. That's not, I mean, who doesn't like food? Good food, bad food, whatever it is. It's, it's very nurturing. It's better than all those stresses in your life. And that's why I'm down in the kitchen. It's because, so I, and that part of my strategy is I'm trying to get rid of as many stresses in my life as possible. So that there's fewer of those things that are kind of pushing me in the wrong direction. Well, I tell you what, uh, Going your own way, you'll get rid of some of your stress. Yeah. <laughs> there's some stressors you won't have to deal with. You well, there, there's a lot less than there's a lot less today than there was two, three years ago already. Um, yep. But you know, you can't avoid all stresses in life. New things come up and take their places from time to time. But I, I'm trying to kind of work through them as they come up instead of kind of let it linger. And that's probably been a bad habit of mine is letting bad things in my life or stressful things linger longer than they have to not get them not process them through and out as quickly as I could have you know part of that male conditioning um, and again it's why I like these subjects so much I mean I love talking about men's issues and this is a men's issue uh, we're conditioned to devalue ourselves uh, people even mock us of men won't go to the doctor like that's some sort of joke. Uh, and what it is, is that men are, are, are constantly conditioned to not take care of themselves, uh, to oh, just yeah. focus on producing. And uh, hopefully, you know, whatever positives that the men's movement, red pill, MGTOW, whatever you want to call it, whatever you do in this sort of uh, alternative universe for men that we've created on the internet, uh, hopefully you begin to challenge that shit too and uh, make commitments to yourself that, uh, you know something, uh, the Cheetos taste great for a while, but it is, it's like smoking or anything else. It will cause problems. That's a great point to end on, I think. Do you think, Paul? Yeah. Right there. Have we been on here a good length of time? I think uh, – 
covered a lot of ground and I want to encourage any viewers to contact either Paul or I, especially if you have um, some success stories or if you have challenges um, that uh, you might want to share um, with us. I think uh, if, it can, if we can help and help each other along, um, kind of move our lives in a healthier manner, I think that'd be great. So thanks for joining us and thanks for joining me, Paul. You have a, and, and before we close out, let me, let me, if you don't mind, I would like to plug one thing for my Patreon. Every Saturday at 5 p.m. Eastern time, we have a group meeting. Uh, it's not group therapy. It's just a bunch of red pill guys meeting uh, via uh, Zoom, the format that you're watching us on right now. And um, we talk about all kinds of things. And uh, you can do something as inconsequential as uh, pledge a buck per video and cap it at one video. So you spend a dollar a month and it gets you into four 90 minute meetings uh, a month where we have a good sized crowd of other red pill guys that are talking about the issues in their lives and you know how they're handling it, how they're dealing with it. You're welcome to join my Patreon and do that. That's great. And I'm going to be on that this Saturday too. Good, in man. We'll be glad to. Now you said it. You got to do it. <laughs> 5 p.m., right? Yes, sir. Saturday. I will get you the link. I was going to join in last week and then I got uh, I was distracted by something. I realized it was after six o'clock when I came back. So missed it. So okay. Be... Well, if you don't show up, man, we're gonna, your ears are going to be burning. <laughs> we're going to talk about you. Okay, thanks, Paul, and let's uh, sign off for tonight, and I hope we can uh, get some, some folks in to talk about their health stories uh, soon. Good night. Take care, guys.